sickness, redeemed from death, redeemed from sin. By the power of the Holy Ghost, it's your season to win. Take your healing, take your freedom, take your favor. joy unspeakable full of glory and we thank you for this another opportunity to minister to your people today revelation knowledge is gifted everybody under the sound of my voice I decree that bodies and yokes are destroyed whatever is not planted by God is rooted out I decree that your people built up, equipped, edified, and everyone connected to this service revelation knowledge gifted you in the name of Jesus Thank you, Father, that by the end of this service, we will all be the better for it. We give you praise for answered prayer. In Jesus' precious name, and every believer says a powerful amen. amen. Lift your right hands to heaven. Let's release our feet together as we say these words. I am born of God. I am born of the world. The word of God is my nature. I do not struggle to do the world. I do the word naturally. Therefore, today, I will understand the word of his grace. I will be built up. By the end of this service, I will never be the same. Never ever be the same again. In Jesus' name. And every believer says a powerful amen. We want to welcome everybody connected to this service by way of Kingdom Life Network, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. We're so glad to welcome all of you, the social media community. And we want to welcome all of the Aquaibom State community connected right now by way of Comfort FM, XL FM, Radio Aquaibom, you know your FM, Inspiration FM, Heritage FM. We're so glad to welcome all of you, the Aquaibom State community. So glad to welcome you this morning. Hey guys, do me the, 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 the pleasure of inviting a friend a family member somebody your colleague ask them to tune to this radio station right now life is flowing through the airwaves it's going to be an exciting study of god's word i also want to ask the social media community family and friends on social media do me the privilege of getting this word out invite a friend Tag some people, you know, drop the video on as many groups as you're connected to on Facebook and on all the platforms. Of course, put the messages on Monogram, Telegram, WhatsApp group. Let's get the word to the ends of the earth. And I want to thank you for doing that for me this morning. And I also want to welcome all our campuses around the world. What a joy to have all of you connected to the service. All the campuses around the world, welcome to the service this morning. And everybody watching, wherever you're watching, we love you. We're glad you're here. And if today is your first time of connecting to these services, well, fasting your seatbelt is going to be a Bible adventure as we study in the light of Christ. Are we excited to be here? Can we celebrate the word of God with a shout this morning? Glory! 
Amen. Grab your pen, your notebook, your Bible, and you can be seated with your sweet, smart self this morning as we get into the word of his grace. Mm-mm. We're examining Bible truths on tithe and tithing. Bible truths on tithe and tithing. We want to examine exegetically the truth concerning the subject of tithe and tithing. We want to look at the myths, the practice, and the malpractice. The myths, the practice, and the malpractice of that subject. And you will have to pay attention because it's a Bible study. And in Bible study, it means we're going to study the Bible. We're going to read so many scriptures. And I'm not just teaching you for you to know. But I'm teaching you on Titan so that you can be able to teach others. So for you to know and to be able to teach others. Second Timothy chapter 3 verse number 15. Second Timothy chapter 3 verse number 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. When you hear the word all scriptures, he's referring to the Old Testament books. So he says, you've known the word oida. You have become acquainted with the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise. The word sophizo, taken from the word sophia in the Greek, is able to make you wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So the scriptures communicate faith in Christ. The scriptures communicate faith in Christ. The next verse says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine and for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The word doctrine there is the word didascalia which means teaching or explanation. The scriptures are for teaching or explanation not just for quotation not just for random quoting it is for explanation or teaching that's the first thing and then when the scriptures are taught when the scriptures are explained they will bring reproof the word reproof there is the word elecos it means to to give you evidence it means you must be able to provide evidence there is no doctrine of scripture that doesn't have evidence in the Old Testament. You didn't hear that? Let me repeat. There is no doctrine of scripture that doesn't have evidence in the Old Testament. Then he now says the scriptures, when they are taught, they will give you profit in the area of correction. The word epanatosis. Epanatosis. It means to set things properly the way they ought to be. Then the last word there is the word instruction in righteousness. The word pedia, it means spiritual growth. That the scriptures, when they are taught and explained well, they will produce in you spiritual growth. Which means, I cannot get spiritual growth in the Old Testament until those things are explained. The Old Testament must be explained. We have a responsibility to explain the Old Testament. For example, Jesus' most exhaustive teaching after resurrection was in Luke 24. Where he said to those guys on the way to Emmaus, O oh fools, 24, 25 to 27. Luke 24, 25 to 27. O oh fools, slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ... To have suffered these things and to enter into his glory. Then Jesus now wants to teach. Look at how he started his teaching. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets. He expounded thy harmonia unto them in all the scriptures. The things concerning himself. The things concerning himself. Interestingly, that's the only teaching of Jesus that doesn't have documentation. What exactly did he teach? Well, it tells us the arrival point of what he taught. The things concerning himself. 
So we said the Bible is a Christocentric material that is, it is centered on the person of the Christ. John 5, 39, Jesus speaking to the Jews said to them, you who search the scriptures for in them, you think you have eternal life, but they are they which testify of me. The scriptures testifies of him. Please pay attention. The Bible is a book of words. That means words will be found in the Bible because the Bible is the written word. So that means the words will require explanation. And in the first service, we began to examine the word tithe, titan, tithe, 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 titan, tithe, tithe, titan. And in the first service, we examined what Jesus said about the tithe. And we took some journey. We saw tithe before the law which is Genesis 14 and Hebrews chapter 7, tithe before the law. Then we saw tithe under the law, which is Exodus till the Gospels, where Jesus taught in Matthew 23. Then we took time in the first service, and I will advise you to get the material because I'm not going to go through that. I have a lot more to go through. We established in the first service this morning conclusively that under the law, Tithe was food. Under the law, tithe was food. They gave food not because there was no money. There was money, but tithe was food. That's where we stopped in the first service. Now, we have tithe before the law, which is Genesis. And the writer of Hebrews made reference to that in Hebrews chapter 7. So, we have tithe before the law, Genesis. Tithe under the law. Tithe in the four gospels and tithe in the epistles. Now, we're going to go into the second and third column because we drew up columns. First column, before the law. Second column, under the law. Third column, the gospels. Fourth column, the epistles. All right, now, so we, we examine in the first service today the second and third column, Old Testament and the gospels. Now we're going to be examining the first and the fourth, which is Genesis and Hebrews. But before that, let's get back to Jesus. Matthew 23, 23. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 23, verse number 23. <clears throat> Woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, hypocrites. <laughs> For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. And have omitted the weightier matters of the law. So tithe is of the law. Jesus said that. You have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Judgment, mercy, and faith. This ought ye to have done and not to leave the order undone. So the intro of this particular scripture we just read will be in Matthew 23, verse 1 to 4. Matthew chapter 23, verse 1 to 4. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples. Next verse. Saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. Verse 4. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Now verse 1 says that they sit in Moses' seat. Moses' seat. What is Moses' seat? Let's begin our walk. What is Moses' seat? John chapter 1 verse 17. John chapter 1 verse 17. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. The law was given by Moses. So Moses' seat is talking about the law of Moses. Why was the law given? Jesus discoursed that a couple of times. And one of the relevant places is Matthew chapter 19 verse 3 to 4. 
Matthew chapter 19 verse 3 to 4. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which met them at the beginning met them male and female? Have you not read Anaginosko? That's a question to ask many believers today. Have you not read when believers are busy saying, the God of my father, the God of my prophet, the God of... Have you not read that God doesn't have stepchildren? That all of us have equal access to God? You don't need to pray in the name of your, the God of your father, Bishop so-and-so, Prophet so-and-so. No, have you not read... That there's no more middle wall of partition. That we all have access to the Father through Christ Jesus. Have you not read? Look at verse 4 now. Jesus is answering their question. And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning? Genesis 2.24. Made them male and female. Next verse. And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife. And they twin shall be one flesh. Verse 6. Wherefore they are no more twin but one flesh. What therefore God had joined together. Let no man put asunder. Verse 7. They say unto him. Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement. And to put her away. Genesis says don't put asunder. But Moses much later under the law says put asunder. Was it a contradiction? No. So Jesus explains why Moses said what he said where the law is concerned. Look at verse 8 of Matthew chapter 19 verse number 8. He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, prostains clerocardian in view of the hardness of your heart. The Greek word prostain clerocardian. I've taught you that many times. In view of the hardness of your heart. That is what Moses gave you to do is the state of your heart. What Moses gave you to do is a reflection of your hearts. He wrote out the state of your heart. So the law reflects the state of man's heart that is not born again. The law is a reflection of a man's heart that is not born again. That is why in Romans chapter 8 verse 2, he tells us that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. The law of life in Christ Jesus. So Moses gave you those instructions because you guys were sinners. That's Jesus' response. Because you guys were sinners. That's why brother Paul will say, the law is not made for the righteous. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, the law is not made for a righteous man, but for sinners. So, if we talk about the Pharisees sitting in Moses' seat, that means whatever they are doing is still in tandem with the law. Whatever the Pharisees are doing is still in tandem with the law. Because of the hardness of their hearts. So the law of tithing was made because of the hardness of men's hearts. The law of tithing was given because of the hardness of men's heart. I will tell you free of charge. That the reason why the tithing law was given was to reflect the selfishness of the people. It was to reflect the se that is the people were so selfish that Moses had to put law to compel them to give. It was a reflection of the gross selfishness of those people. It reflects selfishness. The law of tithing is a reflection 
of selfishness. Let's get back to Matthew 23 again, verse 1 to 4. Please pay attention. Matthew 23, 1 to 4. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Next verse. All therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works. For they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be born and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. So Jesus teaches this as the ministry of the Pharisees. This is the ministry of the Pharisees. The background of his statement on Titan here shows the grievous nature of the law. The grievous nature of the law. And most importantly, the grievous nature of those who were executing it. The grievous nature of those who were executing the law. He wasn't giving a pass mark. He wasn't saying we are in this thing together. He was exposing the grievous nature of the law and the grievous nature of the Pharisees who were executing the law. Jesus often asked the question. I mean, yeah, people often ask the question. Did Jesus pay tithe? Well, we will answer within the week as we keep teaching. So the first reference there is not good stuff. Whoa unto you. All right? Was Jesus teaching tithing? No. What was he doing in Matthew 23? Was he condemning tithing? Or was he explaining it? Huh? Teaching it? Commanding it? Explaining it? Huh? Explaining. The first statement in verse 23, look at it. Matthew 23, 23. Woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. And have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Judgment, mercy and faith. This ought ye to have done and not to leave the order undone. Woe, that's not too nice. Because they sat in Moses' seat. That's why he tells them, woe unto you. They are sitting in Moses' seat. The second place Jesus was talking about, we will talk about tithe. Remember, Jesus spoke just twice. Will be Luke 18. And observe, all the commentaries of Jesus on tithe wasn't nice stuff at all. All the commentaries of Jesus. In Luke 18, many folks actually don't like reading this part of Luke 18, verse 9 and 10. Luke 18, verse 9 and 10. And he spake this parable unto Satin, which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. Pharisee and publican. Publican simply means a sinner. A public sinner. Publican. So let's see what the Pharisee does. Verse 11 and 12 of Luke 18. The Pharisee stood up and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. That means he fasted 104 days of the year. You know, 100 days fasting. 200 days, they were, they were in the same class. They are members of the same club. Okay. Now, Jesus had to include tithe. You know, there are other things in the law. <laughs> but somehow, Jesus only singled out tithe. That's instructive. Tithe is not the only thing in the law. But in this story, Jesus singled out tithe. Jesus is saying, see this proud man trying to justify himself with tithe. 
See this proud man trying to justify himself with tithe. Look at verse 13. Kabayada. Luke 18 verse number 13. And the publican standing afar off will not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven. But smote upon his breast saying, God be merciful to me a sinner. The word he list, he list kamai, he list kamai. That is, I'm a sinner. I'm not qualified to face you. So, please give me a mediator. So, he puts his eyes on the little animal that he brings to the temple. Look at verse 14 of Luke 18. Please pay attention. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalted himself shall be abased. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. All right. Now, so everyone that uses tight as justification shall be abased. That's the implication. Everyone that uses tight as justification shall be abased. So Jesus' commentary doesn't look nice on tight. The law is self. The law of Moses is self self the law of moses is all about self i i i i i i i wherever jesus discussed tithe he discussed it as the law obviously the second person he talks about here is a pharisee and they sit in moses' seat the first time he talked about the pharisee and the law the second time again the Pharisee and the law. So, column 2 and 3. That exodus to Malachi and the four gospels, which we started laying foundation on in the first service, are together. So, let's define the law a little bit. Hebrews chapter number 10. Hebrews 10. Now, observe. Obviously, from what we read in the law, did you observe that the tithe was for worship? How many of you observed that? The tithe was for worship from the things we read under the law. Now, see what the writer of Hebrews says about this. Hebrews chapter 10 verse number 1. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the commerce thereunto perfect. Look at the words he uses. The law having a shadow. The word shadow is the word skia. Skia in the Greek it means thick darkness. Thick darkness. A shadow shows you there is no light. So the law of titan will be what? darkness the law of titan will be darkness because is the law darkness because the law is a shadow a skier pay attention the titan jesus discussed in matthew 23 is it the law matthew 23 is it the law yes the law is what a shadow what is shadow darkness Darkness of good things to come. The law is darkness of good things to come. You will not see the good things by looking at the law. You will not see the good things because the good things are to come. But the law is the darkness of good things to come. Please pay attention. Now, because the law is a scare. You see the word skia in Hebrews chapter 8 verse number 5. Hebrews chapter 8 verse number 5. Pay attention. Hebrews 8 5. Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see saith he that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Shadow of heavenly things shadow of heavenly things second word is the word sacrifice the sacrifices the word susia in the greek is used 29 times see how sacrifices we are used hebrews 
chapter 5 verse 1. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 1. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God. That he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for what? For sins. Gifts and sacrifices for sins. Hebrews 7.27. A lot of scriptures but good for your health. Hebrews chapter 7 verse number 27. Who needed not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. So the word sacrifices in the book of Hebrews is what we are, we are, we are, we are you know, pointing out. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 3. The word sacrifices. Hebrews 8 3. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat to offer. Also to offer. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Take note of the word sacrifices. Which was a figure for the time then present. In which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. So he talks about the sacrifice of the law in tandem with the sacrifice of Jesus. The sacrifice of the law in tandem with the sacrifice of Jesus. He says the sacrifice of the law is a shadow. It is not the real thing. It's a shadow. It's thick darkness. The sacrifice of the law is in darkness. That is the sacrifice of the law is not that which is to come. It's in darkness. Are you still here? It's in darkness. All right, that which is to come is Jesus. That which is to come is Jesus. All right, now Hebrews 9 23. Please pay attention. Hebrews 9 23. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with this, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than this. The heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices. Alright? Pattern, animal sacrifice, all the things they gave. But the heavenly itself with better sacrifices. Hebrews 9.26. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 26. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, had he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. By the sacrifice of himself. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1 now. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1. <clears throat> For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of those things or of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the commas they are on to perfect. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 5. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 5. Wherefore when he cometh into the world he saith sacrifice and offerings that would us not but a body has thou prepared me sacrifice and offering that would us not that is sacrifice and offerings you don't want sacrifices and offerings you don't want that is God is saying I don't want sacrifice I don't want offerings Hebrews 10 8 Hebrews chapter 10 verse 8 Above when he said sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not. Neither has pleasure daring which are offered by the law. He has no pleasure at all in anything offered on the terms of the law. That is the things that are done under the law are an offense. To God. 
They are an offense. He has no pleasure in them. First of all, he said, I don't want offerings. I don't want sacrifices. Then he now said, anything that came from the law doesn't give me pleasure. It's a provocation. It's an offense to me. Now, that is all the sacrifices and offerings under the law. God has no pleasure in them. Is that clear? If it's clear, can I have a better amen? amen. All right. Hebrews 10, 11. <clears throat> Hebrews 10, 11 and 12. And every priest standard daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, but this man, Put it up after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. It can never take away sin. So, the only offering that matters is the offering of Jesus. The only offering that matters. Is the offering of Jesus. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 26. Please stay with me. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 26. For if we sin willfully. After that we have received the knowledge of the truth. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. So the writer of Hebrews used sacrifice for what the law offered. Anything the law offered because it was a shadow. It was a skier. You know, it was a skier. <laughs> Different from what Jesus offered, which is the real deal. The reality. He is saying to you that all those physical offerings. How many of you have been reading the Bible with us? You know we're in numbers now. Huh? Everyone's quiet. Have you gone home or you're here? We're in numbers. Oh. I'm reading along with you people. Oh. Five chapters every day. By next week we finish Deuteronomy. Then I will give you the next phase of readings. You can't afford to be lazy in this church. I forbid you eternally. Kabayada. It's not God forbid. Pastor forbid. Zabadaga. He is saying to you that all those physical offerings... Wave offering, heave offering, uh, sin offering. Uh, all of them were a shadow of the offering of Jesus. That's why the guy in the temple made more sense. He said, can you provide for me a sacrifice? Because there's nothing I can offer that is good enough. Therefore, only God can provide the sacrifice that qualifies to meet the demands of justice where sin is concerned. Only God can offer. So, pay attention. Are you still in the building? So, the, the, the publican was asking for a redeemer. Whereas the Pharisee was saying, well, I have done this. I have given that. I have done that. I have paid my tithe. I can never be poor. I have given my offerings. God must respond. God, God will not disappoint me because I pay my tithe and I fast. Pharisee. Sitting on the seat of Moses. Then he said, that man has exalted himself. He shall be abased. And he that humbleth himself will be exalted. That's why, because he is seeing salvation in the sacrifice or in the offering of the sacrifice for sins. Hebrews 10 1. Listen again. Hebrews 10 verse 1. Mm -mm. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of those things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the commas thereunto perfect. Which they offered how many times? Year by year. And they were offering it continually. It cannot make the commas perfect. The word offer which they offered 
is the Greek word prospero. Prospero. P R O S P H E R O. Used 47 times. It means to bring it, to offer, to bring it. You know, what we read about the tithe, if you remember in the first service, is that they will bring it. Eh? They will bring it. He says, they brought it year by year. Meaning, he's talking about the tithe, which they brought. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 1. Pay attention. Hebrews chapter 5 verse number 1. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Verse 3 now. Verse 3. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that Verse 3, Hebrews 5, 3. And by reason hereof, he ought, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer for sins. Hebrews 7, 27. Who needed not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. Hallelujah. Jesus is the offering. Jesus is the offering. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 3 to 4. Pay attention. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 3 to 4. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. Next verse. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest. Seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. According to the law. Hebrews 9, 25, 26. Lord of scriptures, healthy for your spirit. Nor yet that he should offer himself often. As the high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood of orders. 26. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, had he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Hebrews 13, 15. Hebrews Chapter 13, verse number 15. <clears throat> By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips. The fruit of our lips. Giving thanks to his name. The sacrifice of praise. The only thing we are to offer by him, that is by Jesus. We offer the sacrifice of praise to God. How many times? Continually. So we don't offer anything to God. We don't offer anything to God. We only offer the sacrifice of praise. What we offer will be the sacrifice of praise, which is the fruit of our lips. Because all the offerings and gifts of the Old Testament have been removed by the offering of Jesus. They have been removed by the offering of Jesus. So, what we offer now will be thanking God for Jesus. Now, Hebrews chapter 10, where we started this journey, remember, we are saying all of this because we said column 2. You know, remember column 2? Column 1, Genesis. Column 2, Exodus to Malachi. Column 3, 4 Gospels. Column 4, Epistles. So, Column 2, which is Exodus to Malachi, and Column 3, which are the Gospels, are the same thing. So, all the physical offerings of the Old Testament have been replaced by the offering of Jesus. Every offering for justification for justification in the Old Testament have been replaced by the offering of Jesus. So, do we still offer? Yes. What do we offer? The sacrifice of praise 
which is the fruit of our lips, thanking God for Jesus. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 2. Hebrews 10, 2. For then will they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. So number one he says that these offerings couldn't make the commas dear to perfect. Verse 2 he says the worshippers service that is those who serve the word there is the word latrio. Latrio in the Greek. L-A-T-R-E-U-O. Latrio. It means to serve. It says, if they are once purged, they won't do it again and again and again. Verse 2. The worshippers. Then Hebrews chapter 9 verse 9. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 9 which was a figure for the time then present in which we are offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not, could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. As pertaining to the conscience that did the service. That's what they were doing. They were doing the service, but they were not perfect. Hebrews 9.14. I love the writer of Hebrews. He has helped us a lot. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? The one they did under the law could not purge their conscience. Even though they were doing it every year. But Jesus did it once. And by that one offering, he has purged our conscience forever to serve the living God. I am an agadaga. So we are the true worshippers purged by Jesus. Zemanon Kata. Are you still in the building? <clears throat> so now that our conscience is purged how do we serve God we offer the fruits of our lips giving thanks to his name Hebrews 12 28 Hebrews 12 28 wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved let us have grace. Whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. <clears throat> Same word, latrio, serve God. Hebrews 13.10. Hebrews 13.10. We have an altar. We are off. They have no right to eat. We serve the tabernacle. So all the offerings we are to serve. All the offerings we are to serve. Don't miss that. But now our own consciences have been purged. So we don't do anything to be perfect. We have been perfected by Christ. We are not praying to be perfect. We are not singing to be perfect. We are not worshipping to be perfect. We are perfected. So we offer our offering of thanksgiving in songs, gratitude, and in melody. Teaching good here. So what we do now is to offer the sacrifice of praise, which is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 9. Hebrews 10.9 Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. Dadalodaba, Nekoroto Sakaya. 
There are scriptures you read, you just blast in tongues. Egebene katokona kanaminga. Jegenge, jegenge, jegenge. E barato, barato. Jatola. Menga taya. Now, remember, we are discussing the tithing law. Which Jesus talked about in Matthew 23, 23. And Luke eleven forty two And Luke 18, 10 to 14. Now Hebrews 10, 9. The word take it away is a very strong term. He take it away the first. That he may establish the second. That word take it away. In verse 7, look at verse 7. How does he take it away? Hebrews 10, 7. How does he take it away? Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. How does he take it away? The word take away is the word anero. Anero. Not anero. A narrow, not a narrow, a narrow, a n a i e r o, a narrow is used 24 times. It's a very strong word. You will see where it is used in Matthew 2 16 and Luke 22 2. That's where it is used. Matthew 2 16, Luke 22 2. It's used for murder. Murder to kill the first to abolish it to kill the first to ab so in Jesus the plan of the father is to kill the law to murder the law <laughs> if you want to accuse God for murder that's the one you can accuse him for he murdered the law to murder the law to kill it he takes away the first. He killed the first. He murdered the first. The thing is, there are so many memorial services for the Lord today in many churches. Oh, we miss you tight. Let's do service for tight. Oh, we miss you. Offering of the firstborn. Oh, we miss you. Wave offering. Oh, so many memorial services. Jesus killed the Lord. But the church of Jesus is celebrating the dead law. What a misnomer. What, what nonsense. The law is dead. He takes away the first. He kills it that he may establish the second. The word establish is the word histemai. Histemai. It means to place in or to make to stand. To place in or to make to stand. So he kills the first. He shows you they must not exist side by side. The first and the second cannot be combined practice. No. He kills the first out. Abolish. So that he will establish. He will make to stand or he will place the second in the place of the first. They must not exist side by side. For example, you cannot teach the titan law as given. You cannot teach the titan law as given. You are bringing back what is dead to life. The titan law is not given. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. The titan law is dead. Anybody who drags you to Malachi, anybody who drags you to Malachi chapter 3, drag him to Revelation 22. The Bible says, the dead shall be thrown into the lake of fire. He killed Malachi 3. That he may establish the second. So if they take you to Malachi 3. Take them to Revelation 22. That the dead shall be thrown. Into the lake of fire. If the titan dead is, law is dead. Drag both of them to the lake of fire. 
So, the Titan law has been killed. It must not exist side by side. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me what? Free from the law of sin and death. Jatanaka. Are you catching this? Mark 2 21. Mark chapter 2 verse 21. No man also soweth a piece of new cloth on an old garment. Else, the new piece that filed it, the new piece that filled it up, take it away from the old, and the rent is made worse. Every time you operate the old and new covenant together, it is worse. The only challenge sometimes we have in the body of Christ are those who are trying to mix law and grace. A little grace here, a little law here. They are the most, they are more dangerous than Boko Haram. I, I kid you not. They are more dangerous than Fulani headsmen. Mixing grace and the works of the law. You say we are preaching grace in our church. But you are still saying if you don't pay your tight, it will be tight. Mixture. Dangerous. That's mixture. You say, oh, Christ has done it all. Then you now say, but, but go to your village and bring sand. Uh -uh. Mixture. Very dangerous product. Faith and works. What Christ has done. You mix it with what Moses has done. Uh -uh. He killed the first. That he may his temai the second. Jatana kata. See, anytime that mixture happens, you have a very bad Christianity. That mixture produces bad Christians. Cowards. Christians who are cowards. A native doctor will do a Christian who is under mixture. Here, here, he will run and be looking for who to pray for him. It's a bad product. Christians who don't know their left from their right. Christians that are bamboozled. Anything can just give them. Whoa, whoa. They don't know their left. Mixture. They will pray and still look for people to pray because they believe their own is not good enough. Bad Christians. Bad Christianity. Christians who fear native doctors. Aye! Let me not enter things. I have a whole week. Somebody came and told me that in Igbo land, they have used shrine to destroy his father's family. People are dying in the family. He came to Akwaibom to carry me. I followed him to Igbo land. We enter. We follow road, follow road, follow road, follow road. Finally, we arrive one place that I cannot explain. I told him, show me the shrine. He pointed to the shrine in their compound. I told him, okay, that's the end of the shrine. Don't follow me. Stay here. I went there and urinated on the shrine. I came back and entered the car. I told him, let's go, it's over. That was the end. Though. What ended the shrine? Urine. There are levels. There are levels. They that know their God. They shall be strong and they shall do exploits. There are no gods. No gods. The gods are dead. Ah, how be it? There is not in every man this knowledge. It's a knowledge problem. That's why I told him not to follow me. Let me go and do my thing. When I finish, I say it's over. He said, thank you, man of God. I say it's over. Enter car, let's go back. So it took me just to go and urinate and come back. <laughs> that was the end. Of if you see the kind of testimony he's given everywhere, yet he didn't know that what I did there should get size. And the redeemed of the Lord shall return unto Zion with singing and everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. Hey, leave that thing. Let's go back. Let's go back. Let's go back. Okay. Mm -mm. So you see, anytime that mixture happens, you have a very bad Christianity. It's a bad product. No matter how sincere the recipients are, they are bad products. 
It is not your sincerity that determines your quality. It is the content. The preacher you sit under, what he is putting in, no matter how sincere you are, you cannot be more sincere than the content. What you are hearing from your pastor will determine your make. Garbage in, garbage out. You can compromise anything else in life, but not your relationship with God. I can never sit under any pastor who cannot explain scriptures. Never. I don't care how long the collar has been on his neck. I can never sit under him. What is ministry? Ministry is the explanation of scripture. That's what ministry is. See, I've been laboring here since morning. That's ministry. Excavating scriptures. Opening everywhere in the Bible. Bringing out light. That's ministry. It's not suit and tie. This suit and tie you see me wear is after all the work has been done that I wear it. This is not the work. I can even remove it now and wear a knicker and t-shirt and continue. And the message will still be potent. It's not in clothes. It's in content. And as I'm putting it inside you, you two are becoming a solid product. Jakotana. I say Jakotana. I say Jakotana. When there's a combination, it's worse. The word worse means it's bad enough. That means it's even better to be in the law than to be in mixture. It's better. That's why I say it's worse. It's worse. It's better for someone to be under pure law than to be under the mixture of law and grace. Look at what Jesus said in Mark 2.22. Mark Chapter 2, verse 22. And no man put a new wine into old bottles. Else, the new wine doth burst the bottles. And the wine is spilled. And the bottles will be marred. But new wine must be put into new bottles. It mustn't be done side by side. He has killed the first that he may establish the second. The truth of the matter is this. Anytime people do this, they make a worse state of believers. That is why you will see, you know, Peter was a prototype of a Christian who was under the law. Peter, Peter, Peter. And it was a ministry gift. He was under the law and it was a ministry gift. He had these things, you know, about him. Anger, anger. Jesus told Peter about his death. He rebuked Jesus. Stop that. He has no self-control. They came for Jesus. He brings out a knife. Where the knife appeared from, only God knows. Jesus had to heal that guy so that the record, so that today we will not have problem explaining that God does not kill. Jesus had to put that ear back to help us. He was the fellow. When he was accused of being with Jesus, he started cursing, cursing. I swear, I don't know that man. In Acts chapter 5, Two people, Ananias and Sapphira. Peter killed them. What did they do? Peter conjured up a sin that does not exist in the Bible. Sin against the Holy Ghost. I have never had that thing anywhere outside of where Peter mentioned. <laughs> Even Moses didn't say it. You have seen against the Holy Ghost. Even Moses didn't say such a thing. There they died. The man was too much under the law that even three hours after Ananias died, he, his anger was still high enough to kill the wife. That's a minister who is under the law. A minister under the law. They are full of cursing. They are full of anger. So because of their anger, they will be using cover up to say it's anger against the devil. Anger against the devil. But they are cursing people. They are destroying people with their mouth. That is the way the law functions. That's the way the law operates. There's no grace in them. No graciousness. Even in, their, even in the way they deal with their church members. No, no graciousness. Say you touch me my mistake. You die by correction. <laughs> Did you ever hear Jesus say such a thing? Did you ever hear that from Jesus or his apostles? Teaching good here. 
He killed them. And the Bible says fear fell on everybody. Not fear of God. Though. Fear. God has not given us the spirit of fear. But fear fell on them because flesh was at work, not God. And the Bible says they were magnified. They. They were magnified in the face of the people. Not God was magnified. They, you know those men of God that every time they do something, people will be worshipping them. And they will be feeling cool. They are being magnified. When it is God in operation, it is Jesus that is magnified. So that shows you it was not God that was operating through Peter in that thing. Then Peter had to cool down in Acts chapter 10 when he saw a vision. Animals were coming in a sheet. And God, the angel told him, stand up. Kill and eat. He said, how? 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 It's unclean. He said, shut up. What I have cleaned, you shall not call unclean. That encounter calmed him down. You can imagine that kind of personality. You can imagine what it must have taken brother Paul to confront Peter. You must have extra liver. Paul said, look here Peter, you are a hypocrite. Paul said, that I, I told him to his face. You are a hypocrite. You ate with the Gentiles. You were with us enjoying grace. When you saw these Jews, you pretended you don't know us. I withstood Peter to the face. Then Peter calmed down. But the Paul said to Peter, Peter, you are to be blamed. Then he said to them, Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who has Peter has bewitched you? Who has bewitched you? Having begun in the spirit, Paul's ministry. Are you perfected in the flesh? Peter's ministry. This only will I learn of you. He that worketh miracles among you, doeth he them by works of the law or by the faith of God? Faith, Paul's ministry. Works of the law, Peter. He was defending his ministry. The book of Galatians is brother Paul's defense for the message of Christ. Teaching good here. It's a dangerous thing. Do not teach giving as tithing. Tithing is not giving. Don't ever mix it. Second column. Exodus to Malachi and the four gospels. Tithe in that second column. And third column is not giving. Please, I beg you, don't add tithe to 2 Corinthians 9. Because 2 Corinthians 9 is willingly. Tithe is not willingly. The question will now be, what about Hebrews chapter 7? Because many Bible teachers who teach the New Testament, when they get to Hebrews chapter 7, they get stuck. I will give you an intro. And we will take it up tomorrow. Nehanona. Hebrews 7 verse 2. Mm -mm -mm. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. First, by interpretation, king of righteousness. And after that also, king of Salem, which is king of peace. Now, first of all, have we agreed... That the titan law is killed? Have we agreed that the titan law is dead? Okay. So now what do we have in Hebrews 7? Let me give you some historical background. Historical background. That the tithe did not start with Abraham. I will give you some historical books. They are not extra biblical books. They are just historical books. Just like the way we study words in the Bible, like agape. Agape did not start with Jesus. Agape did not start with Jesus. Because there were books written before the New Testament books that had agape in them. They had agape. So, before this, do we have historical records of the word tithe? Yes, we do. Let me give you some and you can research them because I'll give you my sources. A brief description. There's a, there's a dictionary called the Harper Collins Bible Dictionary. The Harper, Harper, H A R P E R Collins Bible Dictionary. It reminds us that Titan was very common throughout the ancient Near East, 
especially in Mesopotamia, where Neo Babylonian texts from the 6th century BC discuss the collection of tithes as a means of supporting a sanctuary. Other documents indicate that tithing could serve non sacral purposes as well. As an ancient practice, it existed in Babylon, Persia, Egypt, and even China before Israel was ever commanded to tithe. The reason for tithing varied. In the ancient kingdoms like Mesopotamia and among the Hittites, tithes were tributes paid by the vassal kingdom to their suzerians. A vassal is a person or country in a subordinate position to another. Dictionary.com A suzerian is a sovereign or state having some control over another state that is eternally autonomous. By covenant, suzerians required vassals to pay tributes or taxes. This was in exchange for the benefits suzerians rendered to the vassals such as protection and services. The tribute was often a tenth of the vassals produced goods. Here we have the origin of tithing in the world of the Old Testament. A man by the name of David Root historically wrote a book. The book is titled The Acquisition of Territory and Property by Right of Conquest. The Acquisition of Territory and Property by right of conquest. He wrote about the Greeks. He said, in the same manner, the Greeks too, the Carthaginians and the Romans devoted a tenth portion of the spoils of war to their deities. It's historical with the Greeks and the Romans. So they will dedicate, that is, it as a thing of worship to their deities. Another person, Herodotus, on Greek religion, Greek religion, he said the Greek league against Persia, founded in 481, vows a tenth of the spoils of war to the shrine. And there happens after Salamis and Plataea. Another book by the name of Spoils and Compensation. Spoils and Compensation. He says, during the 12th century, Evidence points clear to the growing significance of warfare in the life of the towns, especially in Portugal, Leon, Castel, Oreg, Aragon. Precise indication of these developments are demonstrated in the increase in concern demonstrated by the makers of the municipal charters in three areas closely related to booty. The first is the royal demand to collect one over five tax from the spoils of war. A tax that Christian rulers inherited from the Muslim practice of laying aside a portion of the gains of the jihad. That's cool, right? 133 BC, on the historical facts, of the Roman expansion says for its courageous role in helping to take the, 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 the Russian town of Cori, Cori Ole, Cyrus Machios is planning to accept one tenth of the spoils, was named Corellinus. So it was a practice several years. In the book, Political, Social, Economy, and Military Organization, it was said, in the days of Abu Bakr, much wealth came to the state on the account of the spoils of war. The movable property, one as booty on the battlefield, was known as Kanemia. For fees of the spoils of war was immediately distributed among the soldiers who had taken part in the battle. The remaining one-fifth went to the state. The state, one-fifth share, was further divided into three parts. One part went to the family of the holy prophet. One part went to the caliph, caliph. And one part was kept for welfare purposes. Now, the encyclopedia says it like this. Tithe, a form of taxation, secularly ecclesiastical. Usually, as the name implies, consider one-tenth 
of a man's property or produce. The tax, the tax probably originated in a tribute levied by a conqueror or a ruler upon his subjects. And perhaps the custom of dedicating the tent of the spoils of war to the gods led to the religious extension of the town. The original offerings to deity being first fruits. The custom was almost universally antiquated. It's been thousands of years for Greece and Rome. You can find this in Poliwisoa. The encyclopedia is on the history of Babylon, religion of Babylonia and Assyria. Also on China, the Chinese classics. Also, Egypt struggle for the nation's maspero. The, the general notion of tax or tribute often prevail over that of the tenth part so that hidden halica, halicanosus and philo it was used either as five over ten or tenth. Again, in the book Social Context of Welfare in Anglo-Saxon England, it was said to maintain a war ban a lord needed a constant supply of commodities to support the warriors and gold and silver to give out as gifts. There are two ways in which they could be obtained. If the war ban were strong enough, it would raid neighboring regions and either force them to yield tribute or carry off valuables. Colton was part target of these activities because of the relative ease of driving them from one area to the other. Since raids will often lead to battles, another type of booty will be the war gear of vanquished opponents. The paligan of the dead is frequently mentioned in poetry and then Onetius' body is stripped of its sword and helmet and the Viking warrior attacks peanuts. They are historical books. These are very ancient materials I'm reading from. With the intention of taking his sword, armor, and rings. This was in BC 116. It's not clear how these spoils of war be divided. But it's likely that the majority will have dis been distributed among the participants in the raid. With the proportion being retained by the law. Also... In the book Nikai or Paranos, a description on the base raids, Macanians and Nepat, 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 Nepatians dedicated this to the Olympian Zeus, a tie from the spoils of war. Poinos Mendi was a victor in the competition, made it for the temple. Also, in Edward the Third, King of Illusions, said this through the spoils of war edward was able to refill the bankrupt's treasury heavily ransomed prisoners brought forth fortunes in gold coins to their noble captors who in turn paid a handsome tithe to the king in the book eastern expansion again chapter three it was traditional to give the bands and time government a set percentage of the spoil of war. So historically, the tithe didn't start with Abraham. It was a practice among the hidden. So what Abraham did, because Abraham came from a hidden culture, an idol worshiper. What he did was to respond in honor to another king, or better still, to a priest. So the tithe from the spoils of war predates Abraham. You didn't hear that? Let me repeat. The tithes from the spoils of war from the spoils of war predated Abraham. That's why whether the Hebrews account or Genesis 14 account, you won't find God demanding at all. You won't find God demanding at all. Whether it is Genesis 14 or Hebrews chapter 7. It was required. It was never required of God or asked of God. So the spoils of war tight is a historical fact. Historical fact. These materials are read out in public, 
public arenas. You can research them. You can go check them and read. Read like I read. So you know that I'm not doing you boju boju. Are you following here? So the, the spoils of wolf tight is a historical fact. It predates Abraham. And we will take that on tomorrow. I just gave you a historical background before we enter Hebrews 7 and Genesis 14. So that with this background, you will be understanding what I am expantiating. <laughs> Glory! Glory! But let it be settled with you that the titan law has been killed. Abolished. Somebody say abolished. abolished. Somebody say abolished. abolished. You cannot rely on Matthew 23, 23 or Luke eleven forty two or anywhere. From Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy and down to teach the tithing. No. Why? It has been abolished. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do. In that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law may be fulfilled in us not by us in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit Romans chapter 10 verse 4 put that up as I get ready to pray for you Romans chapter 10 verse 4 for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believe it. Glory to God. Get on your feet. That's our God for you. Egebo Jagan. Nengro do Sakala. Egebo Denge Bata. Stand up. Let's pray in tongues for a few minutes before I pray for you. Egebo Jaganga. Lemonon Koroto Sukelene Mega Lida Barbara Katune Kelia. Jeje Kulata. Bebrene Kengle de Bereketina Kakoloto Bonga. Bagoli. 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 Egebo Jakalota. Membra Nonzo Lombra Nangra Nongro Nangre. Egele Bata. Egele Bata. Egele Bata. Egele Bata. Lift your right hand and say very loud Christ has redeemed me From the curse of the law I am free From the curse of the law I have received Justification by faith In Christ Jesus I am eternally Sanctified, perfected Justified, accepted In the beloved I am the righteousness Of God in Christ Jesus. There is therefore now no condemnation because I am in Christ. I'm the new man in Christ. Amen. 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 Glory to God. Glory to God. Father, I pray for everybody under the sound of my voice in this building, online, on television, on radio. Oh, get my note. All our campuses globally, we declare right now, veils full of the eyes of your people, barriers terminated, your people released to enjoy the liberty that is in Christ Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Barriers terminated. Sickness terminated. Disease terminated. Oppression terminated. In the name of Jesus sick bodies be healed be healed the yoke of religion be broken be broken in the name of Jesus we declare liberty for men all over the world through the preaching of the truth in Christ Jesus thank you father for answer prayer and we rejoice that we are the better for it today thank you for the whole of this week every evening 6 p.m. great times await us times of learning times of unlearning times of growth, times of revelation knowledge. And we declare that the whole earth is filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the water covers the sea. Men are coming to the truth. Disciples are raised. Men are coming to Christ. Barriers are broken. Men are liberated to enjoy the salvation that Christ has provided. 
And we give you praise for answered prayer. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer in this building shouts that amen on a note of finality. Go ahead and let's make some Holy Ghost crazy noise here. That doesn't sound like some Holy Ghost. Let's give in faith, let's give in honor of what Christ has done. We give our offerings to honor the teaching of God's word. Let him that is taught communicate with his teacher in all good things. Every time we teach you the word of God, it's a culture, a doctrinal culture in the epistles to always honor men that labor over you. Bible says, esteem them highly for their work's sake. I'd like you to grab a good offering. If you're watching online, you've been blessed. Grab a good offering. You're watching on television, social media, all our campuses. An honor seed for this word you have had today. An honor seed for this word you have had today. Praise God. Lift it up. Father, we rejoice. And we thank you for the generosity in the hearts of your people to give in honor of what Christ has done. Words are not enough. Lord, our hearts are indicting very good matters as touching the things you have done for us. We are so full of gratitude. Therefore, our pen is like the, our tongue is like the pen of a reading writer. We declare glad tidings and we give you praise and glory. And as we offer, thank you that we have been accepted before you. So our offerings honor your word and honor this ministry. And I decree that this week every need is met supernaturally. In the name of Jesus. Thank you for answered prayer. In Jesus precious name. And every believer says that amen on a note of finality. Amen. Listen carefully. You don't want to go away. I'll be joining Mr. Michael Bush. In the next one minute. In the other studio. To answer your questions and bring more clarity. And I'd, I'd like you to remember tomorrow 6pm. I continue with this teaching throughout the week. You want to invite more people. Help us share the video. Everybody help us share the video on your page. Let's get the world to come to the truth of the gospel. If you didn't attend the first service, get back and watch that teaching. It's critical because it lays a lot of foundation that I won't go back to in the course of the teaching. But we love you guys. Looking forward to serve you the grace of God again tomorrow at 6 p.m. And don't forget to join Michael Bush and myself in the other studio for Ask the Counselor. And enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Looking forward to connect with everybody. And until I come again your way tomorrow, let's celebrate viewers around the world for being a part of this great service today. Glory! Amen! Woo! Glory to God. You will come out and drop your offerings. messages and books by Dr. Abel Damina. Please call plus 234-806-800-9939. Or email powercityoffice at gmail.com. Um, give the account details out to those who might need them. Power City International is the account name. There are three banks. There's FCMB, there is uh, Zenith, and there is UBA. I'll start on this edition of the program with FCMB 2982-68-2028. That's what FCMB Power City International. Zenith is bank number two, 10, 12, 36, 5, 9, 12.
10, 12, 36, 59, 12, Zenith Bank, Steel Power City International. And finally, UBA, 139, 26, 465. UBA, 139, 26, 465, Power City International. For sponsorship, you need to support the program. You need to sponsor what we do, especially on the other mega platforms coming up soon. Call plus 234-803-275-6104 or email Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. The doctor there is GR. Okay. So at this point, I just need to tell you, my name is Michael Bush. I'm the anchor. The production team all joined me to also formally introduce Global Baba, the international televangelist, prolific author. He writes and teaches like no one else does. And see how he's standing there. He's just standing there as if uh, he's not the one. Help me welcome Global Baba, Dr. Edel Damina. The intercontinental, Mr. Bush. Good to see you, Global Baba. So good to see you today. Global Baba. Wow, you look so, good. So Global Baba, the fashionista. Global Baba, have you looked at your jackets? Have you looked at your jackets? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Okay, Global Baba, let's open with prayers, as we always do. Prayers for Aquaibum, prayers for our government and people, prayers for our country. And, of course, prayer for, for our world. Let's pray together. Father, we rejoice that we have the privilege to declare before your word today the things that concerns our peace and concerns the advancement of your kingdom in our time. Thank you for Kwai Bomb State. Thank you for the governor, his cabinet, and all of the public servants that continue to serve us every day. We declare that you keep them, preserve them, meet all their needs, and continually help them to fulfill the purpose for which they are in office. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We pray for our nation and other nations of the world. We decree that the word of the Lord continues to prevail and reign. And that the purpose of God continually finds expression. Thank you that the gospel advances. Souls are saved. Disciples are, are raised. And all over the world. Preachers of the true gospel are rising everywhere. And we rejoice that our prayers are answered right now. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. We are set to go. Global Baba, last night we slept in the middle of nowhere because we're doing anonymous um, readings at the end of the program. So we're going to begin from nowhere anonymously as well. Thank you so much, Global Baba, for the direction we received from you in word. And you too, Mr. Bush, for reading the questions in such a way that Global Baba can answer. I thank God for you too. According to 1 Corinthians 7, 14, Global Baba, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Elsewhere, your children unclean, but now are they holy? Elsewhere, your children unclean, but now are they holy? Sir, if the children can be holy because one of the parents believe or believes, is it therefore okay to say that when both parents are unbelieving, they bear unholy children? That's one. Two, if yes, how is it that all children that are born qualified to go to heaven unless they make a contrary decision from believing the gospel at the age of accountability, Global Baba. Well, again, you must remember the way Brother Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. He said to them, I could not write unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto babes, because you are carnal. So from chapter 3, right to that 7 where we are reading now and over that, everything Brother Paul will be communicating will have a lot of figures of speech. So when he said the believing husband sanctifies the unbelieving wife and vice versa, he was not saying that the believing husband makes the unbelieving wife born again. What it simply means is that the believing wife, because she is connected to a believing husband, will enjoy a level of spiritual covering and blessing by virtue of being in relation with someone who knows the Lord and vice versa. And their children are holy, not holy in the sense that they qualify for heaven, Holy in the sense that they are in an environment where someone who knows the word of God is there to make a difference. Ultimately, a man must believe in Jesus. Ultimately, a child must believe in Jesus. However, babies, there's a difference between babies and children. Babies are, you know, infants who have not yet come to the age of accountability. When they die, they automatically go to heaven because there is justice with compassion. Look at the way Jesus will say it. Suffer the little children to come to me, for of such is the kingdom of God. So children, you know, uh, have not had the ability to make the choice. And because they are not yet there, there's compassion with justice. However, when they get to an age of accountability now, they will have to make the choice. So that's the way it functions with everyone. Okay, so Global Baba, that anonymous entry 
Yeah, very good, very good. That anonymous entry continues now to Matthew 24, 44. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh. What is Jesus talking about here, sir? He was, and how do we become ready? No, he was talking to the Jews that they should be ready. Is a figure of speech, it's a parable. What he was saying is that you people are not even ready. The Son of Man you've been waiting for has come and you don't even know. So he was using that to reveal to them that he is already among them. To be ready simply means, you know, to know that the, the master, the savior is among them. Okay. For us, readiness is receiving Christ. Once you receive Christ, you're born again, you're ready. You're in heaven already. Okay, so he continues, he or she continues. Please, uh, uh, Global Baba, kindly shed some detailed gospel light on Romans 8, 5 to 8, so I can know where I stand as a Christian with respect to those. Romans 8, what does he mean by for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace? What death is he talking about? Well, carnally minded is referring to a man without Christ. Spiritually minded is referring to a man with Christ. He was just dealing with the two natures, the nature of the born again man and the nature of the man that is not born again. So he was explaining both natures. If you come to verse 8, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Give me verse 9. But you are not in the flesh. So he's dealing with the two natures, the believer and the unbeliever. And he's using flesh and spirit to explain the two natures. Okay, so he concludes now, he or she concludes. Uh, Global Baba, what does he mean in verses 7 and 8 by enmity against God and not being able to please God? 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God for it's not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. 8, so then... They that are the flesh cannot please God. Just That's exactly that. what we've explained. Okay. He's dealing with the nature of the man that is not born again and the man that is born again. The man that is born again pleases God. He pleases God because he's in Christ and Christ pleases God all the time. The man that is not born again, no matter what he does, even if he does good things, he does not please God because he has rejected what qualifies him to please God. And that's the person of Jesus. But the next anonymous entry is... A longish one. It's so, so long. Global by comes in pages one, two, three, four. And it's just one question, you know. So I try to see what I can do. It opens. It says, Global Baba, I've sent you a detailed email. But it's like I attached the wrong attachment. So I have copied from my WhatsApp message and pasted my, my pastor's point of argument from Second Samuel 12, 16 to 23, that God killed David's son and afterwards blessed him. That God shouldn't be taken for granted, that God can do and undo. But I am left frustrated because I know from what I've learned so far from your doctrine that God is not a killer. Below is what I copied from my pastor supporting that is clearly written in the scriptures, how God loves. And at the same time can kill depending on the situation. Please, sir, brief me on this issue with Bible scriptures. Clearly painting God as a killer, is that where my past, that, because that's where my pastor is holding on. That is clearly written in the Bible. And the pastor has left a long, long one. And talks about the fact that, uh, I mean, God kills and supports it with the Bible verses. Well, obviously, your pastor is mentally agitated. Your pastor is suffering from paralagizomai. It means he is not balanced in his thinking. If you read the Bible very clearly, Jesus said, I am. I am the only way to God, meaning I am the only revelation of God. If God kills, Jesus will have killed. Jesus never killed. God cannot kill. He that has seen me has seen the Father. What I see my Father do, that I do. First John 1, 5. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. God cannot be light and darkness, good and bad. That will make God a bipolar God. God is not bipolar. He's not suffering from a disease. So what happened to that child? What happened to that child was the inactivity of God. God removed his hand from that sin. And because God was not involved, the outcome of that sin was death. The wages of sin is death. So that child dying cannot be God punishing. God loves man so much. And because he loves you, he has made provisions. Instead of you dying, he died for you. God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So, you know, uh, you may not be able to convince your pastor because your pastor may be seeing you like a member of his church. Therefore, you can't convince him. So the best thing to do is to pray for him. 
you know, try not to join issues with him because where he is right now in his mind, he has a mindset. It will take him humbling himself and allowing somebody to correct that thinking pattern. Otherwise, he will keep maintaining that position. So the best you can do is pray for him. But you yourself must know that God does not kill and make alive. God is only life. God only gives life. John chapter 1 verse 1, 4, 5. He says, in him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shines in darkness. God is light and life. He's not death and disaster. Okay, so Global Baba, the, his pastor, I, I would just like us to dwell on that a little because the producer and I had a long argument about this. So I'd like us to also put out what the pastor said. The pastor continues, it's also the common mistake that some Christians make about God. They only see one side of God and refuse to see other sides. For example, God is the God of love, but he's also the God of justice. In the time of Noah, who sent the flood to destroy the earth? Was it Satan? No. Read the account in Genesis 6, 5 to 8 as follows. 5, and God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, and he repented the laws Mr. that Bush, he had made let me save you stress. Mm. That man has a mindset that even if he spent 10 years teaching, he will never come to terms. God cannot have two sides. The moment you say God has two sides, what you mean is that God is the one responsible for death. That means God is the creator of sin. That means God created sin and used sin to trap man. Then when man entered, God killed him. That makes God a wicked God. That can be my father. But the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5 verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. So now, the justice of God. We are not denying the justice of God. God is a God of justice. God is just in all his ways. It is because he is a just God that he does not overlook sin. It is because he is a just God that he punishes sin. It is because it is a just God that the wages of sin is death. So how does God in his justice punish sin? How does God in his justice not let sin go unpunished? In his justice, seeing that no man has what it takes to pay for sin, he became a man. And when he became a man, he took the sin of man on himself. And he died the death that man should die. And in dying the death, expressed his love to man. Now hold on. So, in the expression of his love, when you believe in that love, sin and its consequences are terminated in your life. That is the gospel. Mr. Bush, I know where the man is coming from. I know the school of thought. Mm. That's what I'm saying. The, the, the discourse will be endless. That's why the email is four, ch mm. four chapters. <laughs> The, the man is coming from a mindset that believes that God sets the trap. You fall in the trap. He punishes you. It's a very ungodly mindset. But how can a pastor think like oh, that? He's not the only one. There are many of them. It's a whole school of thought. It's a whole school of thought. They believe that God is behind evil. They believe that God uses evil to punish his children. They believe all sorts. You know, and all of that, they call it the justice of God. But look at the justice of God. Romans chapter 5 verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. That's the justice of God. Global Baba. The intercontinental. Okay, two more anonymous sticks, then we uh, find a way to some far-flung continent of the world, and that will be Australia or Oceania. We'll be going there in a moment. This anonymous entry, hello, Global Baba, I need your counsel on how to go about a disciple that is addicted to porn. He has been on it for more than seven years, sir. Whenever he tries to stop it, he always finds himself in it again. He has made so many promises to himself to stop, but he couldn't. He even fasted because of this addiction, but all to know avail global baba. What should I help him do? Well, if you have somebody, a disciple who is addicted to porn, put less emphasis on the porn. Don't make the porn an issue. Make him hearing the word an issue. If he keeps hearing the word, after a while, the word will change his appetite. When his appetite is changed, the desire for porn will die. 
On his own, he will walk out of it. But if you make the pawn an issue, you will torment him and torment him, and he doesn't have what it takes to be free from it. So look at this. We all with open face, beholding the glory of God as in a mirror, we are changed into that same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit. So the Spirit of God does the work when the man focuses on Christ. Ultimately, it is Christ that brings the change. Okay. Our last anonymous entry on this edition of the program. Hello, Global Baba. May you please explain to me in details the counsel of God according to Psalms 81.1. Is this more like the board of directors? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's thinking like a natural man. The counsel of God simply means the entire plan, purpose, the, 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 the program of God. And the counsel of God is salvation. Okay. That's the whole counsel of God. God's whole plan. You think counsel? Yes, that counsel, counsel is God's counsel. Oh. 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 Oh, Global Baba. <laughs> so that counsel is it, God's counsel. The counsel of God. Oh, my. That is what, what is God's intended plan. Man. What is God cooking to carry out? The only thing God is, has been cooking from the beginning of time is to save man. Okay. Global Baba, you know, just about um, five seconds, 10, 15 marks, seconds back in time, you answered a question that I think that same answer would hold for this man. All the way on this edition of the program. Hello. Many thanks for joining us. You know where you're calling from? Good afternoon, Global Baba. Afternoon. Bless you. And intercontinental Sam Michael Bush. Many thanks from Ocean State. That's your friend. Mm. This is Reverend Sam Adela. From Oshobo, Ocean State. We thank God for your life and for the program. Thank you. Papa, before my question, I want to say this in a lighter mood. Uh, witnessing post service. Me as a pastor and my family, we always get late to church in a lighter mood. Why do you go late? <laughs> because we like eating and eating and eating and eating the word from you. By the time we get to church, we shall move with the power of God. That's right. <laughs> so bless God. Bless you. And the bless you, man of God. Whenever bless. I teach now, my children and my family, they will say, we are done Mm. That's right. I will say, don't worry, don't worry. All is Christ. That's right. That's Amen. right. Amen. Amen. Now, my question is, Luke chapter 23, verse 23. I just want you to please help us through more life. Numbers 23. Bless you, sir. Numbers 23, 23. Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any divination against Israel. According to this time, it shall be said of Jacob and of Israel, what God hath wrought. Next verse. Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion and lion. Okay. You know, in the time of Jacob, when all of those Jacob, J Jacob, Esau, Abraham, there was a lot of idol worship and there was a lot of enchantment and witchcraft. But because the children of Israel had a special covenant with God, because of that covenant, that covenant prevented a lot of evil things against Israel to prosper because of that covenant. So it is in the strength of that covenant that Moses was talking about the fact that no enchantment against Jacob. Remember, Jacob's name was changed to Israel, meaning a prince with God. So the position these people had with God gave them that opportunity to function in a specific level of authority by virtue of the assignment of God on their lives. So that's what he was talking about in Numbers. Okay, so Global Baba, let's run back to the continent of Australia and Oceania and try to fly straight to the UK. That is the continent of Europe. Dear Honorable General. <laughs> Global Baba. <laughs> that's, that's a new one again. That's another one for you. Keep, Honorable General. They keep bringing new ones. Oh no, Global Baba. <laughs> No, Baba, I discovered you a few months ago. I love the way you do exegesis on the scriptures. Please stand with us in prayer for a fruit of the womb. I desire your mentorship program also. 
Furthermore, please expatiate on this subject. Are there only nine spiritual gifts in the Bible? What about Ephesians 4, 8 to 12, Romans 12, 6 to 8, 1 Corinthians 12, 8 to 12? Thank you and God bless you more. David Mandy in the UK. Well, David Mandy, those gifts of the Spirit in Corinthians, where Brother Paul listed them all out, he was showing you how those offices function with the gifts. Because within those nine gifts are all the offices. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, they operate with those nine gifts. So yes, there are those nine gifts, but there are other gifts. Like giving is a gift of the Spirit. Like ruling is part of it. In the book of Romans, he talked about other gifts that can be found in the church for the edifying of the saints. Okay, so we, we may I'm, progress. I'm supposed to pray for the fruit of the womb. The womb, oh. Okay. Oh, Father, so, we, we pray for this family right now. We stand in faith for the fruit of the womb. Amen. And we declare that you receive that miracle. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This caller, I apologize for keeping you longer than necessary on the line, but your time starts now. Hello. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, Papa. Afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Bush. Good afternoon. Um, Lord Dumo, calling from Power City of Kobo. Okay. You know, the, the first service was so impacted when you talked about Jesus. That is not just a name, it's an authority. Yes. And also after that, I, was, I just started to go do a little scan of my Bible. Okay. The only place I see Je Paul, um, the apostle used the name of Jesus was when Peter told the man, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Yes. So directly using the name. Other place was used referring to the teaching or the preaching or the victory name of Jesus in his teaching or in the teaching of the death, burial, and resurrection. Yes. Now in prayer, I want to know that. How should it be used? Is it right to be every time you will pray, you use the name, the name of Jesus? Or can we just declare without using the name that we know that we are speaking in that authority and it will still come to pass? Thank you very much, sir. Well, again, Jesus said, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Yes, so when you pray, having known the authority and that office, I mean, you are free to use in Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name. Sometimes you may not use it, the important thing is that you communicated and you have undeniable access to the Father. Okay, Global Baba, we, we need to go. We just have a little under four minutes, but let's see what happens. So from the continent of Europe, uh, we're going straight, we're coming straight to Africa. South Africa, here we come, dear Global Baba. My name is Michael Shabalala from South Africa. Thanks be to our Lord Jesus Christ for revealing God through revelation knowledge using a, a just man like you. My question is about the prophetic gift. Please, can you clarify some more? Because it's very controversial in the sense that many of them received the gifts before they are even born of God. Most of them know nothing about God. Some even starting ministry based on the gift they have, they have, but no knowledge of the Bible. What kind of gift is that, Lobo Baba? Who are they working for? Thank you so much, Lobo Baba and Mr. Bush. Well, there's a gift of, uh, of, of the Spirit, and there's also the gift of divination and sorcery. And sometimes the operation of sorcery and divination may look like the gifts of the Spirit. Because there's a woman in Acts chapter 16 who was following Brother Paul and saying, these men are the men of the, Mo of the Most High who show us the way of salvation. The prophecy was accurate. But the Bible says, after two days, Brother Paul turned and said, you unclean spirit out of her. And the spirit left her and she could no more prophesy. So, you know, that's, there's that spirit of, of, of divination. Global Baba. Yeah, they, we need to go, but we still can um, take this one. Um, Global Baba, my name is Emmanuel Lazarus. Doesn't tell us where he's writing from. Says, My questions are I've heard many preachers say that rapture is, is expected to happen three years from now or not more than 10 years from now. So, sir, how is this true in the light of the gospel? And, and two, what happens to the people on earth after the rapture? Leave those people alone. Leave them alone. Those are all these uh, theories, you know. Somebody, that's how somebody came out last year and said, Jesus is coming December, last December the 9th. And the people that he told did a video, and I called the people and said, on the 10th of December, we will have this discourse. Mm. So when I called them on the 10th of December, they laughed. They said, the man said that, no, that he miscalculated the calendar, mm. that it will be February. Mm. Mm -hmm. All of those people are just doing uh, trial and error. I'm telling you, nobody has the accurate date right now. But when the time comes, we will know the time. We will know the time. We will have an understanding of the season and the time. It will not take us by surprise. 
but to start calculating calendar dates is out of scriptural teaching. We need to go. We need to go. Global Baba. Yeah. Well, so we're spending the night in South Africa. Yes. But we need to go. Tomorrow is another day. So on behalf of my production team and everyone, this is Michael Bush, your anchor, inviting Global Baba, Dr. Ebel Damina, to take us home. Global Baba, have Intercontinental. Now listen to me, everybody. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to serve you the grace of God. You don't want to miss our broadcast right now on XLFM 1 to 3 and 3 to 5 on Uno Yo FM. And this evening, 8 to, I'm 9 to 10 on inspiration and of course 10 to 12 on uh, Excel. heritage Excel. heritage Excel. fm tomorrow morning 11 to 1 on radio acquire bomb 1 to 3 on xl 3 to 5 on you know you and FM. tomorrow evening 6 to 8 we're back here live comfort. on comfort fm we love you guys and always a joy to serve you the grace of god and looking forward to seeing all of you tomorrow and until we see you tomorrow enjoy the rest of your day and be blessed goodbye from you nigeria